Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Welcome back to Business Innovators Radio. I'm your host, Frank Falker. My guest today is Roger Stevens, who's a business performance expert and CEO of Prize Performance LLC here in Alexandria, Virginia. Roger Stevens, welcome to the program. Thank you, Frank. Today, we're going to talk about selling your business. And this is a topic that apparently many business owners don't really think about. And I'll tell you why it is that I say that. Uh, In my book, Unlocking the M-Cube, I talk about the fact that, uh, you know, we often hear that 50% of businesses fail in the first five years and so on and so forth. And I'm not really sure exactly how tight that statistic is. But from one uh, measure, which is whether or not you successfully sell your business when you decided to move on and do something else, over 99% of American small businesses are failures. And let me tell you where I get that figure from. According to Forbes, uh, every month on average in the United States, 623,000 companies are founded. But according to a website called bizbuysell.com that tracks business sales across the country, only 7,000 businesses are sold every year. That's less than far less than 1% of the number founded. So I would like to start with this, Roger. That's an astounding statistic when you think about it. Why is it that you think that so few business owners even consider selling their business? Well, Frank, a lot of business owners look at their business as a job or as an activity uh, or as an income And it would help them dramatically if they could look at that business as a means to an end of retirement. Right now, there's a lot of statistics out there about why these businesses are or are not selling. And right now, the big trend in the business sales market is the baby boomer generation. It's the baby boomers who are running companies in many places, many states around the United States, And these baby boomers are approaching retirement age. They have great businesses. Their businesses have served them well over the many years. And now it comes time to plan and prepare for their exit. And that exit can have many forms. Selling is one of them. I guess but my question would be, why aren't they considering that? Why do so few people, it almost seems as though they don't even believe their business could be sold. They're not even considering it. Yes. So sometimes what happens is they don't understand what the value of their business is. It's not always easy to figure out. uh, But if you can figure it out, you can realize and achieve the retirement goals you're looking for. And so uh, looking at your business and whether or not it's generating income, that's your main factor there. Uh, The businesses that generate income always carry a value. It's a matter of how much. If you're not carrying, generating an income, then the business is probably not going to do so well and not survive. And that makes perfect sense. Um, if the company is insolvent, then you know nobody wants that. Nobody's going to pay for that. And I do believe that that extreme variance between those two figures of the number of companies founded and those sold has a lot to do with the fact that a very small percentage of the companies founded ever get to the point where they're profitable and uh, generating a steady income. But, you know, outside of the company uh, being insolvent or uh, not generating revenue or not generating uh, profit, are there any other reasons why a buyer would not would find a particular company unpurchasable? Uh, Yes. If a company has a bad reputation, if the company just isn't viewed well by their customers uh, or if the company just isn't generating a profit, of course, that's the main reason why. Uh, However, uh, if their employees have have a high turnover, if their products or services aren't doing a very good job, or in other words, uh, could be drawing uh, uh, ire from their clients or lawsuits from other people, obviously that uh, business would not be very viable. Now, I know that your business model, the service that you provide, is providing valuations for going concerns and also helping those companies to improve what their valuation might be over time. The performance, that's where your business performance expert status comes in. Um, Nonetheless, you know, before we get into how you create a valuation, the types of valuations that you do, 
Can you tell me just, is there really such a thing as a rule of thumb of what someone's business might be worth? For example, I often heard that a figure of one times last year's revenue or three times last year's profits might be a reasonable rule of thumb uh, for predicting a valuation. What's your reaction to that? Yes, it's a good approach to take. Uh, what I would say is this rule of thumb actually applies to the smaller business market. That would be businesses under $5 million in annual revenues and under $1 million in uh, what I call EBITDA or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Those particular businesses are very often sold with simple multiples. Uh, most of the time, those multiples are about an EBITDA, uh, but they can be other things such as sales uh, or perhaps other metrics. Well, and you know, it's an interesting thing when we talk about that. All at once, it, let's just say we have those two figures. Um, we know what the top line revenue is, and then we have a rule of thumb that perhaps this business, it's under $5 million in revenue, could sell for whatever that top line revenue number is, just as a rule of thumb. It's so many variables, and you'll speak to that in a little while. It just seems yeah. shocking to me that a company or a business owner would just decide that on, you know, on February 23rd, we're closing the doors and moving to the lake house. And they wouldn't even consider selling it when six, seven figures of potential sales value could be realized. Uh, I just find that shocking. And one thing that you yeah. said, and you just mentioned the levels of revenue, is that companies or business owners whose companies have lower revenue, under $5 million, are much less likely to consider a sale. And those with $5 million and more are much more likely. Why do you figure that That's is? That's right. Uh, that's because the businesses over $5 million a year are actually proven themselves over time and have grown to thresholds that prove management as well as the products and services they offer. And that makes them marginally more valuable than the custody, excuse me, the companies that are under $5 million a year. Now, let me throw out an actual range to use for those companies that are under $5 million a year in revenue. Uh, in most cases, in most industries, and this is an industry-specific situation, you can reasonably expect to see a valuation between two and seven times EBITDA for most industries. This isn't wow. exact, this isn't perfect, but for most industries, you can expect your company to be valued at two to seven times your EBITDA. And that can mean a lot of things. So let me just uh, run a quick set of numbers. If you have a $5 million company in revenues, you have a million dollars in EBITDA, two to seven times means you have a $2 million to $7 million value on average. It's not exact, it's not perfect, it's not uh, something you can go to market sure. with, but it is something that you can rely on as a ballpark figure. That's a considerable amount of money. If you scale that down to 500,000, for example, you could be looking at 1 million to three and a half million dollars, for example. Uh, so the dollars can be larger than most people believe, and you can capitalize on those anytime you choose as a business owner. As I say, we will talk about the uh, valuation services that you offer and uh, what's involved and, and what uh, somebody might expect. But um, in terms of, let's just say somebody at, at uh, $5 million top line, the, the first illustration you gave, and they were looking at $2 million sale price. Everybody has a... Uh, this magic thought that somebody's going to stroke them a check for $2 million and they'll pay their capital gains and then they'll, you know, live happily ever after. Isn't it true that an all cash purchase is, is very rare? It is. It's on the low probability side of how a deal is structured when you sell a business. The high probability scenario says that you're most likely going to have some blend of cash and financing involved. It's inevitable financing has a slew of possibilities that we can talk about in a little more detail if you like, but those are the two uh, scenarios, low probability uh, being an all cash and walk away on the spot. A high probability is the business owner is gonna stick around for 12 to 18 months and there's gonna be some financing involved and there's gonna be a gradual transition of both knowledge and capital as the transaction progresses and the transition becomes successful. Great. And so um, what you're referring to there, is that what's known as an earn out or, or is that part of it? What, what is an earn out? 
Yeah, there are, there are many scenarios to this financing. And an earnout means that there is financing involved and the payments of the financing are conditional based on future performance targets. Mm. That could mean certain revenue targets, certain EBITDA targets, for example. And as you hit those targets, the selling uh, party gets qualifies for the next payment or the next tranche of uh, funding to satisfy whatever amount of uh, transactional balance they're financing. Now, what about the idea of, uh, you know, we often think that somebody, an individual, maybe a high net worth individual would come in and buy your customer, a company. But isn't it also the case that frequently uh, smaller companies or even larger companies are acquired by other companies? They're sort of absorbed, their their client list, their plant equipment, their intellectual property and that sort of thing is just sort of injected into another company. How frequently does that happen? That does happen. It doesn't happen all the time. It happens in a, uh, I would say, maybe a third or a quarter of the time. Mm-hmm. And under those situations, there's something that the target company has that the acquiring company needs and wants desperately. And I'll give you a classic example from a client of mine. Several years ago, I had a client in the chimney sweeping industry, and they had some great services around uh, cleaning and servicing and repairing and refurbishing chimneys. In that situation, they had a great client base in a specific region. Under one strategic scenario, if a company were to come in and acquire this particular company in a strategic way, They might be a company from another city who decides they want a foothold in our city and they do not have one yet. So they can purchase a company to gain that foothold. Uh, That is one way to do it. It could also mean that that other company that's acquiring is a masonry company, for example, and they want to acquire a chimney sweep so that they can expand their suite of services. That would be a second example of a uh, strategic acquisition. That makes sense. I, I understand what you're saying. What about this? Um, this happens at some frequency. Your company is acquired by a public company, and they may want to pay you in part or in full in shares. How would you react if one of your clients came to you and said they'd received an offer like that? I would very much encourage them to take that offer seriously because these public companies, and and I'll throw out some statistics, but they generally run their companies in a far more efficient way than the smaller privately owned company. And I'll give you some statistics as a specific example. Larger companies are known to have between two and 4% uh, of fat in their expense or cost structure where the private company very often has 20 to 40% fat or extra cost in their cost structure. And so uh, it's very, very attractive for a public company to come in to a a smaller privately owned company and buy that company and issue their shares. Therefore, with the way that they run their companies as a public company, you as a receiver of the shares of that public company could very easily benefit handsomely, not just for the price of your company, but for the future appreciation of those shares. Wow, that's a great point, uh, how that public company could then leverage their purchase of you by squeezing out that 38% of fat. And then everybody benefits because the value of the public company goes up, which increases the share price. That's that's really neat. I'd never thought about that. Now, um, you let's talk a little bit about the services that you provide. Uh, a company will come to you, a business owner comes to you and says, I, I need to find out what my company's worth. Now, clearly, maybe they have an offer, what have you, but what are the reasons why a business owner would come to you and ask for evaluation? Yes. The, first of all, those business owners that come to me are largely privately owned businesses, and they are very often in a wide variety of situations. Uh, I've had companies come to me that say, uh, you know, one of my relatives passed away, they own this company, I'm inheriting their shares and I need to know what the shares are worth. That's considered uh, estate related. I've had other companies come to me and say, hey, I wanna shift shares around inside the company between myself, the current partial owner and another partial owner that still exists. I wanna reward them or I wanna reward an employee by giving them shares in the company. 
And then by doing that, by transferring those shares, anytime a transfer is made, it's very important to put a value on those shares for that uh, employee's uh, value of what was transferred at that time. Okay. In other situations, it's a buy-sell situation where a company owner comes to me and says, hey, you know, we're considering selling our company and we need to make plans. And one of the steps we need to do as part of selling our company is to understand what it's worth. So those are the main reasons why people come to me to look for a business valuation. Now, with that in mind, it's important that they can feel secure that you know what the heck you're doing and, and what you're talking about. I understand that you have uh, different certifications and so forth that are based on your knowledge and experience uh, that add additional gravitas to the valuations you deliver. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, valuations are based primarily on your EBITDA. That's the number one factor for what the outcome of your valuation looks like. There's more to it than that. Again, EBITDA being earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that, but that is your number one driver of what your valuation actually is going to look like. Uh, and if your company has three years to five years of history, of growing revenues and growing profitability and growing cash flow, that's your ideal scenario. Those are some of the best case scenarios, but I obviously have other clients who come to me saying, hey, I'm in a, I need to retire. I've had a little bit of a health crisis. I need to leave now. People want to step out of their business relatively quickly, and they may or may not have time to prepare. Sometimes that happens. But my background is about running companies uh, early in my career, running finance departments uh, in uh, large public companies. In the second leg of my career, it was about running uh, information systems for large public clients around the country while I was working at both Oracle and Cognos under the uh, umbrella of a, an enterprise planning, excuse me, an enterprise performance management system that helps these companies to look at their financial situation and operational situation and drive forward by modeling their business and determining what their future performance would be given the assumptions that are within their business of how they're operating. And you can play, you know, what if scenarios with that just as much as you can look at your actual performance. And what I do in that area in the, uh, is I take that as a key element of a business valuation and I put that into the context of a business valuation because one of the uh, key elements of the business valuation process is to project forward in five years in time to determine what their future outlook probability looks like. And that's and something so that's that you help with as well is, is helping them do everything they can now and in the near term to increase their valuation going forward. What sort of things can a company do to help improve that? Yeah, one of the things they can do is a really, really helpful thing they can do is to plan ahead because this is a multi-year process. If you're able to plan ahead and you're able to plan and, and execute on three to five years of great company performance, then you're doing extremely well. Now, there are other things you can do to help bolster that. One of those things is you keep a very clean set of books that are very transparent because the buyer is going to come in and look at your books very carefully. That means if you have an internal accountant or an outside accountant, or if you have audited books, those all help dramatically. If you're following generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP, that also helps dramatically. Uh, other things you can do is to have things like a highly reliable income. That means having agreements with your customers that ensure a generous uh, long-term income stream done by written contract where the customer has agreed that they will pay you or your company a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of revenue over a certain period of time with renew, you know, renewal clauses, for example. Um, those all help bolster the strength of your income stream. Because remember, it's the income stream that makes a difference here, the biggest difference on your business valuation. Isn't it true also that having a long-term lease in place for uh, your manufacturing plant or your retail store or that sort of thing uh, is, is a benefit or, or adds to the value. I, I always heard that, but I always thought, well, is that really a benefit? Because it seems to limit your flexibility. How do you look at that? 
Yeah, I look at that as a double-edged sword. A long-term lease could be a good deal and a good long-term lease, but it's relative to the market. One of the things I do in a business valuation is to judge whether or not a business is paying market rates for these leases. And what I try to tell my clients is this lease uh, is very helpful if you have a little bit of flexibility in uh, raising or lowering that lease according to how much space you need or what the current market rates are. If you have that flexibility, then you're in a little bit of a better position. But if you don't have flexibility and you're paying a, a, a significant lease rate and that le lease is actually going uh, uh, more and more expensive, it may not be to your benefit to have a long-term lease if, if your lease rates are driving higher and higher and the market might be out of sync with that. So uh, the lease is a double-edged sword, very much. I'm glad you agree. That's uh, Actually, I always saw it as more of a hindrance. Uh, but in any event, there's uh, clearly two ways of looking at it. Now, when you're doing your valuations outside of the financial statements, do you also look at things like how competitive the marketplace is that this company is in, both geographically and, and industry-wise? And also, how future technology might impact this, not only this company, but the whole industry that it's in? Do you look at exogenous variables like that? I do. I look at what systems the company is using. I look at the composition of their clients. I also look at the market around the company and determine where this company's placement is in that market. Uh, is this a an in-demand industry, for example? What do the industry statistics say? Or what do the, I, I often draw the industry performance metrics for the industry as a whole and compare them to what the client is doing so that a buyer can look and see what do those uh, statistics comparisons look like? Are there is their EBITDA better or worse than their uh, industry? Uh, and in that case, we're using the metrics of net operating margin and using the percentages of revenue in order to determine: uh, Are you earning a better percentage of revenue uh, EBITDA than the industry as a whole? If you're doing that, that adds value to your business. Now, you have three different levels of service that you provide in terms of valuations. Could you tell us uh, what those three are and give us a little insight into each? Yes. Uh, what I've done is I've constructed three different kinds of valuations, and these are intended for different situations. And, and I'll take a moment or two on each, but let me just give you the three first of all. Uh, for the smaller business or the business who needs to grow, especially in the growth area, um, I offer a package that is uh, what I call a valuation light. It uses one method, it's a simple method, and it's only an approximation of value. It takes a number of things into account and it provides the business owner with a ballpark value. It's intended for a business owner to grow their business going forward. If the nature or if the uh, uh, situation uh, warrants it, I'll provide the business owner with some sort of alternate forecast scenarios with accompanying alternate valuations so that they can grow their business over three to five years, for example, with a reasonable estimate of what their valuation would be when they reach the end of that road and they make those target, uh, uh, target metrics of revenue and EBITDA. Uh, the second package I offer is about a what I call a formal valuation. It uh, is intended for the business in the buy-sell situation, and it is uh, meeting all of the standards of the AICPA and the ASA. There are um, two different business valuation standards there, and because it meets those standards, it actually holds up to scrutiny in the buy-sell marketplace, and it lends credibility to both the buyer and the seller. It's much more precise. It's actually much more accurate, and it takes three different valuations and blends it together in order to come up with both a range of figures and a single figure for the value of the company. Those three valuation methods include both market methods as well as the uh, income methods. So um, we're looking at a much more precise way of setting this up. On the third option, we're talking about what I call a business condition assessment. Um, again, this, uh, this includes the business valuation from the second option, but what it also includes is additional analysis, ex uh, expansive analysis that profiles the health of the company. 
those business owners who are in the buy sell marketplace with their business who have a healthy business can actually promote and illustrate the health of their business to a potential buyer or seller. Uh, and I can provide them with the independent analysis and insights in order for them to see and understand uh, where these benefits and, and health pockets are in the company and promote a company for sale in such a way that we're still adhering to the uh, methodologies and standards of the formal methodology, or excuse me, the formal valuation. So, so those are the three pieces that I offer. And again, they're intended for different purposes. Can you tell us uh, how long the process is for each of those three different approaches? The process actually isn't that long. I normally take a roughly five to 10 business days for any of those three options. Uh, there are some other providers out there that do dram take dramatically more time. I try to turn them around within five to 10 business days because I know that a business owner in many cases have got other events that are going to happen after evaluation takes place. And so I'm able to deliver that valuation relatively quickly in order to meet their schedule. We're just about out of time, Roger. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, if someone's been listening or watching and, and is interested in hearing, is interested in what they've heard from you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? You can reach me by email at info.prize-performance.com. Okay, and that's info at prize-performance.com. And, uh, and when can they expect that you might uh, get back to them? I can usually get back to you within one or two business days. I want to leave uh, with this question, Roger. I'm sure any business owner that's heard what you've had to say here today, their head is probably spinning. And they're thinking, you know, when do I want to sell and how much do I need to get to retire? Who knows what they're thinking of? And they're wondering, probably the number one thing they're wondering is, what should I do next? What, what do you think is the best next step that a business owner can take to begin moving towards a successful sale of their company? Well, they can enlist help. Uh, what they can do is enlist the help of someone like myself, who is a business performance expert who also does valuations. This is a unique and custom skill. Uh, you can also enlist help with representation if you're far enough down the road that you're ready to list your business for sale. That representation may take the form of a business broker for those small businesses under $5 million a year in revenues, or it may be an M&A uh, representative for those businesses over $5 million in revenues. But if you're not ready to list, then it would be a good idea to hire someone like myself to help you evaluate your performance, how much your business is worth, and how you're performing so that you can clean up your books, make arrangements, do other things that you need to do in order to present your business well for sale. Roger Stevens, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks again to Roger Stevens, and thank you for joining me. Until next time, I'm Frank Felker saying, I'll see you on the radio. Forgiving your entrepreneurial sins with a gentle wave of his microphone, here's Frank Felker. To Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.